It's Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022, and I call this meeting of the House Higher Education Committee to order. The CLA will take the roll. Chair Bernardi. Present. Bernardi, present. Vice Chair Christensen. Present. Christensen, present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, present. O'Neill, present. Representative Albright. Albright, present. Albright, present. Representative Daniels. Daniels, present. Daniels, present. Representative Erickson. Erickson, present. Erickson, present. Representative Hansen. Hansen, present. Hansen, present. Representative Heinzman. Representative Heinzman. Representative Howard. Representative Howard. Howard, present. Howard, present. Representative Keeler. Keeler, present. Keeler, present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, present. Cleborn, present. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick. Representative Creshaw. Representative Creshaw. Representative Mason. Mason, present. Mason, present. Representative Meckland. Meckland, present. Meckland, present. Representative Noor. Noor, present. Noor, present. Representative Sandell. Sandell, present. Sandell, present. Representative Sandstead. Present. Sandstead, present. Representative Thompson. Thompson, present. Thompson, present. Representative Heinzman. Present. Heinzman, present. Representative Kosnick. Representative Creshaw. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Thank you very much. Next, may I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 22nd, 2022. So moved, Madam Chair. Representative Noor moves approval of the minutes for March 22nd, 2022. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes for March 22, 2022 are approved. First on the agenda, we have House Bill 4490, no, excuse me, 4449 from Representative Noor. We have 30 minutes scheduled for this bill and we will plan to wrap up at 335. I will move that House Bill 4449 be laid over for possible inclusion. We have before us House Bill 4449. Representative Noor has an author's amendment labeled A1. I will move the A1 amendment to put the bill in the form that the author wants. Representative Noor, can you tell us briefly what the amendment does? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the A1 amendment just uh, clarifies a section of the Pell Grant for which the grant applicant is eligible. That's all it does, Madam Chair and members. Okay. Members, is, is there any discussion? Is there um, any discussion to the amendment? All, all those in favor, signif motion, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. We have before us House File 4449. Representative Noor, please present your bill to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, House File 4449 establishes a free college grant for students who really deserve it. Uh, Madam Chair and members, we're going to have a workforce that is going to reflect the future, knowing that the shortages that we're expecting is going to continue. Uh, we do have an opportunity today to make sure that we invest in our youth, in our, in our college students to get them the help they need, the best educated workforce requires us to invest in college for all. We can make this a reality by investing in students who need the most. Madam Chair and members, this program will establish a free college grant for students based on their income and also taking into account the other programs that they're receiving. This is intended to provide a free college for students who are making less than 100,000 adjusted gross income for the family. It also goes up to 50% for students 
whose family adjusted gross income is less than 125,000. Members, if we're going to rip the rewards when our students are able to pursue higher education without accumulating crushing debt, as you're all aware of, uh, many students have given up on higher education because of the crushing debt that they have. By lending them a hand, we can make that a reality. And the best way to do that is to invest in them. And I think we can, uh, with the resources that we have and with the opportunity that we have, we can create that reality for all. And I ask for your support on this bill. Uh, Madam Chair, we have Ohi here to answer any questions in terms of establishing this program and um, here to answer any questions if members have any. Thank you very much. We have with us here to testify today, Karina Valeda. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Karina Valeda. I'm 26 years old and I currently attend Inver Hills Community College. I'm pursuing my bachelor's in political science and a law degree. I would like to start off with a statistic found from Georgetown University. Posted on their website, it says, college educated workers now produce more than half of the nation's annual economic value. When I was 14, my mother opened up a store called Lempo Market located on Rice University in Minnesota, in St. Paul, um, where I helped her make the store successful since she didn't speak a lot of English. This made me an exceptionally hardworking, highly motivated student. When I graduated, I decided um, not to go to college due to high costs and not to mention my parents were scared of co-signing my loans. A free college grant program would have been beneficial at the time. At the age of 20, I tried to enroll into college and fi the financial aid lady told me that when I would graduate, I would be roughly looking at paying about $600 a month. I then decided to start saving my money. Uh, I worked at the casino for about eight years and a college free grant program around that time would have made my enrollment to college happen sooner than that. I enrolled into college in the spring of 2021. I currently work 32 hours a week, which leaves me with roughly around $200 a month. And that is typically spent in groceries. It scares me to think what is going to happen when I graduate with my bachelor's and law degree in the future as far as payment uh, towards student loans. A college free grant program would help ease my worries for the future and even ease my mental health to increase my overall happiness and to keep my academic success um, on, the path, on the right path and probably even improve my mental health. Growing up in Minneapolis and St. Paul, I often see a lot of articles on people that I recognize from my high school that have been involved in gangs, shootings, overdoses, crimes, prostitutions, and sometimes even death. A free college grant program can help build people's confidence and dreams, especially in youth. And if something like this was around back when I graduated, I'm sure it would have kept some of those people alive off the streets and even out of jail. The benefits of college, as you may know, are to improve education, but with that comes more ethical values as you learn more about people and leadership. Educated people can help solve problems and create better solutions. Education comes with stability and even boosting a country's productivity and JDP as people sort themselves to finding suitable higher paying jobs. I can see low income students going to college for free and in the future being less dependent on government assistant programs. I have gone through what this program can do for me and hopefully it passes. If it doesn't, let's just hope I don't drop out of college because of the cost. Uh, I would definitely wish for a world, world with more education so we could be more ethical, knowledgeable, nice, peaceful, and a happier people in this world. I would hope to more than repay any investment of public money through grant programs with future contributions to society. I would like to thank Rep. Noor for authorizing this bill and for the committee for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. And now we have uh, Ali Tomaszek. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you. For the record, my name is Ali Tomaszek. I'm very happy to be here with the committee. Thank you so much for giving me the space. 
I am a STEM student at North Hennepin Community College, which I'm at right now um, in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And I always thought that college was going to be a chance for freedom, reinvention, and discovery. However, my first college experience wasn't exactly a reinvention, but more like a roller coaster. I was tossed between frustrating coursework and long, stressful shifts at a part time job. Expenses were too high, and tuition was and still is overwhelming for me. In 2015, I dropped out of college. They say college is a break of passage because it's like the start of your adult life. For many low-income students, it's the first time living on their own, and parents can't contribute to their tuition nor their living expenses. They start making critical decisions about their future, taking on debt, deciding where to live, choosing a career, whether or not they want a family or not. No pressure. Dropping out was really hard on me, but I've worked really hard to get back on track. I'm 27 now and have re-enrolled back into community college, but really students like me shouldn't have to risk financial trauma to get an education. If the cost of tuition was covered, many students like me would have maybe taken a second thought at dropping out of college. In the last year, enrollment has significantly decreased and college program Promise programs like the HF449 have proven successful at boosting enrollment and getting people the degrees they need to be successful in the workforce. Passing this bill would boost enrollment for low income and returning students just like me. So thank you for giving myself and other students like Karina the space to speak and share our experiences with the committee. We really appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Members, I will note that we have a written testimony that was included in the materials for day and posted on the committee page online. Members, is there any discussion to House Bill 4449? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Knorr, um, I have a couple of questions and I'll just start with um, a comment and Whenever we've had bills like this, and, and there's several over the years that I have uh, been able to hear the presentation, I get uh, I get a, a little bit of a I don't know. There's a little frustration because the the uh, implication is that there's really no other option for free college other than the presented legislation, when in fact. Minnesota was the very first state in the entire country under Artie Carlson as governor to offer uh, the opportunity to junior and senior uh, high school students, PSEO, the post-secondary enrollment option. And you know, I just always feel that maybe that should be discussed whenever we bring up programs and, and uh, opportunities quote unquote like this because I think that it's it's really important that we at least acknowledge that Minnesota has broken ground on a program that is now a part of uh, several other states uh, statutory support for for students who would otherwise uh, potentially have not had the opportunity to get dual credit for free or get full uh, college in the schools, a CIS program for free and enjoy that. So I just, I like to bring that up and mention that so that nobody is confused. Minnesota technically does have a phenomenal opportunity for students who would want to participate and get that dual credit as a PSEO student. So that's uh, what I wanted to quickly discuss. And if we could, uh, Representative Noor, I, I did have a question to follow that on line 1.10. Um, if somebody could give us a definition or at least a ballpark idea what uh, the criteria that is required for a student under 136A.121 and specifically the financial requirements that I'm seeing listed, because even when I looked it up, I couldn't find it. 
if anybody might have that. And I know you have a testifier here today, Representative Knorr. Uh, I just want to make sure that that we're helping as many students as we possibly can in this language, even if it uh, doesn't necessarily move forward. It'd be good to know kind of who is and isn't eligible to receive this help. Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, for that purpose, because OHI will be managing this uh, program when we get it going, so I'll defer that to OHI to go briefly on some of the programs that uh, we have listed on the bill. Uh, so, uh, would you like to go to uh, OHI now? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, um, I'm Nikki Oliver. I'm Assuming that you will be responding to that. I'm Madam Chair, and for the record, my name is Nikki Oliver, Director of Grants and Government Relations for the Office of Higher Education. Um, could Representative Heitzman ask the question again? I didn't hear it. What, what was the question? Sorry. Representative Heitzman. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in line 1.10, there's it says, uh, well, I'll start in 1.9, eligibility. A student is eligible for a free college grant if the student, and then on to 1.10, receives a state grant award under section 136A.121. And I did look up that statute, but it references in, in uh, I, I won't say line four, but it says, um, number line three, I guess, has met the financial criteria established in Minnesota rules. And I didn't, I wasn't able to find that. And I'm not sure what the financial criteria might be that this bill under that language establishes. And if that's something that we have to talk about at a later time, that's fine. But uh, it, 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 I think it's important that we understand who is potentially able to access the, the dollars that this bill is putting forward and who isn't and what the financial criteria would be. Uh, Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, yeah, it sounds like you're, you're correct. The statute reference was, it's a reference to the state grant program. And your question about um, what the financial need criteria is, I think I'd have to get back to you because obviously I have to go find the rules unless Nicole uh, Whalen, who also runs and helps with our state grant program has an answer. I don't think she does. She helps more with the calculations, but um, she may have an and Nope, it sounds like she doesn't. So we, we can follow up to you about what that criteria is, um, if you don't mind. Madam Representative Chair. Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. That would be that would be fine uh, to get that information at our time. But every time these kinds of bills come forward, it it's often uh, uh, got many of or has many of these kind of qualifications to the language, and it sounds on the surface like you know literally anybody could apply and and be successful and and get support and get you know, their, their education paid for. And, and often that's not the case. So it's good to have that conversation when the bills are brought forward and in a committee and, and we can uh, maybe look at that more closely when that information is provided. But of course, at the moment, the, the bill author doesn't have that. And so, um, you know, just, just a word to folks bringing these, it would be nice to have some of those definitions uh, at the presentation of the bill. So, there's no misunderstandings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I apologize. I was, I was uh, talking to somebody really quickly at the beginning of this. And so if this was said, I apologize. But um, there is a blank appropriation in the bill. So when I'm looking at the end of the bill, um, line 2.16, there's a blank appropriation. And it says just for year 2023. So do we have any sense as to what the fiscal cost of this bill would be? And I, as I read the bill, it looks like it's a one-year appropriation. I'm not sure how you stand up a program with a one-year appropriation. Can you explain what the intent was on uh, 2.16 as far as how much it costs and is this standing up a program or is this a one-time appropriation? Hell, uh, would uh, Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for President O'Neill. 
I think the the way we have drafted it, we're waiting for the fiscal note, uh, which was requested on this bill, because as far as I understand, it's going to cost less than even $40 million, and which we intend to make sure that this great program uh, is sustained uh, in the long haul. I think also to respond to uh, Repre uh, Representative Heinzman, I think the uh, the statute 136A.121 identifies the state uh, grant program, hence it's included as part of the definition of trying to meet that eligibility. So it's more quite clear in how that is established. So, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, yeah, I know that this bill was just introduced two days ago. It does not have a Senate companion. First deadline is on Friday. So this was introduced incredibly late into the second year of the biennium. So I would, I would totally understand why there wouldn't be a fiscal note. Um, but also as Representative Heinzman has said, this is something that we've talked about over time. So I was hoping you'd have a little bit better idea. And maybe it's only gonna be 40 million. I, I kind of think it's gonna be a bit more. But in any case, um, I do see that this is a last in dollar. So you, basically go through, you've got your state grants and the Pell Grants and scholarships and all of those things are deducted first and this is a last. And so my question then is, and, and I'm not sure if oh, he can answer this because I uh, weren't able to answer Representative Heinzman's question, but my question is, you've said it at, so a family making 100,000 or less gets the full amount covered. But I know that on the other end, those that are uh, very poor, <laughs> the, the low end, get most, if not all, of their college paid for now. Can you just explain where that line is? I, I wonder if Ohi could kind of explain that to the committee. Because um, mm -hmm. right now, if this would be a last in, so I'm not sure how much is between the bottom and the 100,000, if you could kind of give us a ballpark. Uh, uh, Ms. Oliver. Yes, Madam Chair, I defer to Nicole Whalen on that question. Uh, and just to clarify, I think she also can give an estimate of the cost. And then uh, to answer Representative O'Neill's question about, are you asking the, where the, the income thresholds are for, related to this bill? Is that the question? So. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, the income threshold. Um, so uh, there's a certain threshold where all their college is paid for now. And I wanna know kind of where that threshold is compared to the 100,000 uh, of family income. And where is that, that middle spot that we're hitting? Uh, and I know that it incrementally, it's a kind of a scaled uh, amount past that. So it's 75% um, is paid if you're 100,000 100, to 125,000 and so on, it goes to 50%. So I'm just curious as to what the bottom tier is. Ms. Whalen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Nicole Whalen and I am a research analyst with the Office of Higher Education. Um, so there's a, a couple of questions, I guess, um, to answer here. So I'll start with the easy question. Um, so uh, in regards to the cost of the of the bill, um, as it's written currently, and again, uh, we, we do not have a formal fiscal note available on this yet, but um, currently the, the kind of general cost of the bill is looking to be a roughly $35 million per year. Um, and a big driver of that is that this bill um, is only available at our um, two-year colleges uh, in the state system. Uh, which does keep the cost down significantly. Um, and then to answer the other question, so um, I'm sorry, I don't have the specific numbers off the top of my head, but I would say generally speaking, uh, the Office of Higher Education um, typically says that um, students from families making earning um, $40,000 a year or less are typically able to receive 100% of um, their tuition and fees covered through a combination of Pell Grants and state grants. So it's really that kind of um, kind of middle but between kind of 50 and $100,000 would be the kind of the bulk of where these dollars would go. Representative O'Neill, do you have a follow-up question? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one other quick one. I, I appreciate that. So it gives us a little bit better picture as to what this is doing. So my next question, my last question is actually for Representative Noor. And I and he may not know because he just introduced this two days ago and there is no Senate companion. But if this is only for students going to the Men's State system, have you heard from the private colleges? Have you heard from University of Minnesota? Do they have concerns that we're uh, focusing only on Men's State? Um, that's the only place that people could go to receive this benefit. Representative Noor. Uh, Madam Chair and, and members, uh, I know this bill will have a companion in the Senate. As you've noted, we just introduced it. We've been talking about it for a long time. So that one is going to be happening. And then the conversation with the, uh, the private colleges, the U of M, I think there are different programs that meet different, but then the obligation to Min State is critical. Uh, so because many of our students in our districts across the state uh, usually are enrolled in Min State. Okay, Representative O'Neill, is that you're done with your follow-up question? Just a, just a final comment quickly. Um, Thank you, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that would be of concern to me, not that, uh, you know, it's important for us not to pick with winners and losers. And in this case, we're picking Men's State as a huge winner, and maybe that's the right policy choice. I don't know, but it, it definitely narrows where a student can go. Um, I, I would think that University of Minnesota system and the private colleges, the 28 private colleges might have something to say about that. Uh, I realize again that this was just introduced and maybe they haven't had a time to had time to reach out to us to uh, voice those concerns, but I gotta guess, I, I would think that we're gonna hear from them pretty soon. Thank you, Madam Chair, that's all I have. Okay, Representative Thompson, and we have. Um, hey, my, my, my question was answered, uh, Chair. I didn't put my hand down. I, I don't need to answer. Okay, thank you. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and to uh, Representative Knorr or to OE, my first question of two is um, what stipulations would be placed upon the grant recipient, you know, pursuant to. Uh, a degree granting program, a certain uh, GPA? Are you just basing that um, grant based upon the assumption that they'll attend? What type of uh, responsibility does the student have to complete and attend uh, in, a, in, a, in an adequate way based upon competency, the, the program for which they're asking for that funding? And I would have a follow-up, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Noor. Um, the, the restrictions, as far as I know, are similar to the other grant programs. Uh, so OHI can respond to that, but there isn't any restrictions that we put in this bill. Representative Albright. M Madam Chair, um, that would be a concern to me. For, uh, if, if, if there are no restrictions, I trust that what Representative Noor is discussing our responsibilities on the student's part to complete uh, those uh, programs. Uh, second, and it's a two part. Uh, the first is the grant received is that for a year uh, or a semester, as opposed to for the entirety of the degree granting program for which they're uh, going to enter and apply for. And then is there a cap on the amount of money that would be awarded to any student based upon whatever financial need? Uh, so, in a sense, if one uh, need oh, her student had a need for 25,000 and another student had a need for 50,000 would there be a cap and what what responsibility uh it, does this program have owed to each person that applies representative newer uh, madam chair and uh representative albright i think the way uh we have drafted this we're looking at the family adjusted gross income uh, and that's how we want to make sure that those who are receiving, uh, you know, uh, less than a hundred thousand family adjusted gross income will get the full hundred percent student support. Representative Albright, are you? Do you have a follow -up? Uh, no, I, I, I just that I would. 
it's it's laudable that we want to provide for a workforce of the future. And and while I I, I can't disagree with the uh, the desire for the state to promote um, the availability of funding to to encourage uh, students to uh, attend, I, I think that's quite a different uh, a equation to make sure that they are completing it and that they are completing it for purposes that do generate bona fide income sources that will be beneficial to the state going forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Cleveland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I would like to thank Representative Noor for bringing this bill forward. You know, um, to Representative Albright's point, this bill would help alleviate the workforce shortages that we are currently facing. It also uh, is really expanding and broadening the economic opportunities and prosperity for many individuals in our state. And it's a great opportunity to lift our families and individuals into the middle class. And ultimately, um, as Chair Noor well knows, this will help uh, ultimately strengthen our state's economy. So I just wanna say thank you for bringing this bill forward and helping our state move forward with a lot less debt. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further uh, discussion, Representative Noor, any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chen members for listening to me on this bill. Uh, free college grants uh, members is a game changer. It provides equal access to educational opportunities, eliminates student loan debt, and ensures best educated workforce as you are all aware of. This is the time, this is the moment, it's the right time to invest into the future, uh, next generation of workforce in the state of Minnesota. If we're committed to that, this will be the best support that we can provide for our students. And I ask for your support. Thank you, Madam Chen members. Thank you very much. Hearing no further discussion, I will renew my motion that House Bill 4449, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill is laid over. Next on the agenda, we have House Bill 4020 from Representative Sandell. We have 25 minutes scheduled for this bill, and we plan to wrap up at 4 p.m. I will move that House Bill 4020 be laid over for possible inclusion. Oh, excuse me, we have before us House Bill 4020, Representative Sandell, please present your bill to the committee. Represent Representative Sandell, there you go. Madam Chair, members and staff, some of you may remember the stop we made during our 2019 mini session at Southeast Technical College in, uh, uh, in Winona. There were more than 100 students and their faculty in the uh, room, 100 uh, high school students and teachers, their students and um, principals. The trades union and business people represented two or three college deans and their presidents were all eager to talk about the relationship between high schools, community college, Winona State, and the area's economic development. Much of the conversation was about the need and opportunities for students in career and technical education, the need for young men and women to join the trades after high school, the need for teachers to, pre to prepare them, and the need for college programs to prepare those teachers. The conversation led to legislation sponsored by Representative Pulowski in the House and Senator Miller in the state, establishing a model program at Minn State Winona and Southeast College to address those challenges. Students can now receive community college credits in career and technical fields while in high school. They'll be prepared to join the workforce or continue study at Southeast and, if they wish, go on to WSU with college credits in their pocket and promising career opportunities in their future. House File 4020 requests an appropriation of $1 million to expand that program to at least three other Minn State schools, community colleges, and cooperating school districts. As a former teacher, it's easy to recognize that that's a great opportunity and encouragement for a lot of young men and women. We're fortunate, and I'm especially grateful today, to have with us Representative Pulowski, Winona State President Scott Olson, and Dr. Jean Haar, Dean of Education at Minnesota State Mankato, to describe their interest in this initiative and the opportunities it offers. Madam Chair, if um, you'd um, um, agree, I'd like to begin with uh, Representative Pulowski to talk about where the uh, idea came from and go on to uh, uh, President Olson and uh, Dr. Haar. Okay, well, welcome to the committee, Representative Pulowski. Madam Chair, I, I think it would be more appropriate to have our guests go first. Um, folks from uh, out of town, even though we're on Zoom. 
Okay. Uh, break, outrank us. <laughs> okay, that's right. Thank you. Repre uh, we have Dean Jean Hall with us today. Welcome to our committee all the way from Mankato. Madam Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I serve as the Dean for the, of Education at Minnesota State Mankato, and um, I know that President Olson and Representative Plowski can share in more detail what Winona has established. I would just share that the Deans of Education across the university system meet on a regular basis. We work on a number of initiatives of trying to think about what and how can Minnesota State meet the needs of educators and what K-12 schools and the workforce needs. Um, are and as we look at this potential uh, of duplicating and expanding the pilot that is established in Winona, we can learn from that and we have a collaborative group of individuals that would determine what and how can we duplicate this in a manner that uh, expands the state and meets more students' needs wherever they're located. Thank you very much. We also have with us President Scott Olson, all the way from Monona. Uh, Chair Bernardi, members of the committee, thank you for hearing Representative Sendell's bill. Um, thank you for everything you do for Minnesota, and uh, thank you for funding this career and technical ed teacher program. As Representative Sendell noted, uh, this idea began at the mini session in Winona, so thank you all for coming down to Winona for that mini session. We're really excited about the vision to have every high school student graduate with employable skills. Um, and that provides the employees that Minnesota's employers need now more than ever. Um, the one-time dollars you provided are supporting the creation of this curriculum. And we're right now in the process of hiring some career and technical ed uh, professors who would be licensed to teach in this area, but also be able to help our students earn the license so they can go out into Minnesota schools and teach what we used to call VOTEC back when I was in uh, middle school and high school in Minnesota. Um, this pays back your investment on the Education Village here in Winona. This is a great use for it. Um, and um, we're it, it, it's a great model that is replicable, which is the heart of Representative Sandell's bill, because um, it's, it's about partnering a, a technical college where the students would be learning the trade skills with the license in the teaching area so that they can actually go and teach others how to do this. Um, it's designed to serve really three different groups of students, traditional students who might come in at age 18, knowing this is what they want to do. They would start at the tech college. They would do about two years there, maybe a little more, learn the trades, then come to the university to learn uh, how to be a teacher. But we're also looking at mid-career teachers, somebody who might want to add an additional license in this career and technical ed area, and also mid-career folks in the trades Folks who may work in manufacturing, work as welders, work in transportation, but want to give back at a teacher at this point in their life. It is designed to be rec replicable. And I can't think of anybody better than Dr. Jean Haar, uh, who is an absolutely fantastic dean of education. Um, and we would love to work with her when this thing gets out of the pilot phase and it's ready to be replicated in other parts of the state. But it is replicable. And I just want to conclude by thanking you for investing in Minnesota's future in the way you did in the last session. It really makes a huge difference. And we're so excited to be working on it. And with that, Rep uh, Representative Bernardi, Chair Bernardi, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's time for Chair Pulowski. Welcome to our committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also want to thank uh, President Scott Olson. He co-chaired the committee with me that set up the Winona mini session. That was October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. We had a series of 12 meetings over four months with as many as 45 people attending to have hearings in Winona, Austin, Rochester, Caledonia, Rushford, and Preston. The core meeting that Representative Sandell attended was a critical meeting. It was part of the theme of the Winona Mini session. And the theme was a simple one, that every high school senior in Winona and Minnesota should have the opportunity to graduate, not just with a traditional high school diploma, but with an employable skill set. And that was the theme of the legislation that's now being implemented by President Olson. And it's also the theme of the legislation that, Pres or that Representative Sandell has.
Okay. Well, that's, well, thank you very much, Tara Pulowski. And that was a wonderful event you hosted in Winona for us. And uh, the hospitality by all the community was uh, very touching and very memorable. I know it gets talked about a number of times e over each of our years. So we still haven't forgot about that great experience you provided us. So thank you to um, uh, Chair Pulowski, President Olson, and um, everyone else who was involved in making that happen. Do you have um, members? Are there any questions, any discussion? Representative O'Neill. Madam Chair, I, I was kind of hoping to hear like uh, an update of how the pilot project went, like how many people they had go through and how many of, you know, what was the success so far? Can anyone kind of give us some of an update on the pilot? Uh, uh, President Olson. Uh, Chair Bernardi, Representative O'Neill, uh, the money uh, just came to us, I think, in August or September. So we are in the process right now of designing that curriculum. We're hiring the faculty to teach it. The pilot actually begins next fall. That's when the new students will be admitted into the program. And we'll be delighted to come give you an update after that. Uh, Representative O'Neill. So... Ms. Uh, Representative Sandell, we're expanding before we start. Is that what you're doing here? You're, you're expanding the pilot project before we've even launched the pilot project. Is that is that what we're doing here, Representative Sandell? Representative Sandell. Chair Bernardi and uh, Representative uh, O'Neill, uh, good ideas are, um, uh, are, are um, I suppose, uh, uh, particularly promising. I've, I've seen uh, projects like this and I'm uh, uh, not afraid to put my confidence in the work that's being done at um, uh, at Winona and um, that other schools, community colleges, as well as, as universities are interested in, in pursuing. I heard this morning a, um, a presentation by uh, another one of our members for a similar project, which uh, would serve uh, at least four counties. And the, the uh, uh, proposal that, uh, um, Representative Marquardt uh, offered was uh, similarly promising. This is a, uh, an idea that I think we can't be afraid of, and I'm uh, eager to pursue it. Representative O'Neill, do you have a follow-up? I don't, but <laughs> can we just stand up one and see how it goes before we expand? I mean, I know that there is $12 billion of money out there. That includes what's in the reserves, but you know, let, let's just stand one up and see how it goes first before we expand to three more. Can we just take a pause and just stand one up and see how it goes? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Sandell, did you have a follow up? Representative Bernardi, I spent uh, part of the morning talking to a representative of the, of the uh, building uh, and construction trades. Um, and we talked about uh, uh, the uh, the pressures that his uh, or in, uh, his uh, industry was under. We also talked about um, uh, vocational high school that was in the center of Minneapolis while I was growing up. The building is still there, but unfortunately, Volk uh, uh, no longer offers classes there. The OJT or on the job training programs that were uh, uh, that were successful uh, years ago are seldom found any longer. Uh, we were talking about uh, the opportunities for uh, young people to uh, participate during the summer in uh, 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 programs in both high school and in community colleges that, that focus on the trades. Uh, uh, Superintendent uh, Joe Brown, who I think uh, you probably recognize uh, uh, from Southern Minnesota, uh, has uh, programs at, at his high school as well. This is uh, uh, not uh, um, um, unexplored land, and I think that it's a, a project that uh, you and I would uh, um, Love to see uh, uh, grow and prosper. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and to my good friend, Representative Pulowski, uh, thank you for um, persevering. Uh, we carried this bill jointly uh, some time ago. And uh, to you, President Olson, uh, thank you for inspiring uh, so many uh, to really uh, pick up the mantle of, of the trades. And I, I say those things because I came from an era when the trades and the technical uh, career paths were still offered in high school, where you could graduate from high school, not only as has been said with a, a degree or a diploma, but also with a, a saleable skill. Um, 
sadly, I think that's sorely lacking coming out of, of, of the uh, high school K-12 educational system right now. Candidly, I couldn't think of a better approach than to prepare the teachers to be inspired to teach those kids about what it means to uh, work with your hands, work with your mind, um, and, and to see something uh, come of it. And it's not just about the trades from the last you know, 20, 30 years. The trades also include those in the computer fields, in IT, in cybersecurity, where right now there are 9,000 jobs wanting for people uh, to fill them with incredibly well-paying jobs. And so while I'm uh, jealous that I uh, uh, am not uh, co-authoring this bill as I did with Representative Pulowski, I, I wish uh, the current author Godspeed and I uh, wholeheartedly support this initiative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, seeing no further discussion, I will um, give it back to uh, Representative Sandell for closing remarks. Thank you, Chair Bernardi and uh, uh, Dr. Haar and, and um, uh, President Olson and Representative uh, Pulowski. Uh, uh, I certainly appreciate it as a personal favor to be, uh, be here today, as well as a, a dedication to the students that uh, we all serve. Representative Albright, I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I couldn't help but smile and, and be enthusiastic about uh, and grateful for your words of, um, uh, of encouragement. Um, I, I agree with you that that uh, the trades were important while I was in school. Uh, I participated in the OJT program uh, at, at a printing shop when I was in high school, and uh, I still use the skills and the ideas that uh, that I learned there. I chose not to go in the trades, but uh, it is a a, 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 a a wonderful opportunity. I I. Uh, I'm enthusiastic about this bill. I was inspired by the event in Winona. Uh, Dr. Har and I began talking about this uh, um, 18 months ago, and and uh, she introduced me to uh, uh, t teachers and faculty at St. Cloud, and also uh, uh, their rep their uh, legislative. Uh, uh, group at Minn State. So I, I, um, uh, I'm enthusiastic about this and I, uh, I, I, um, uh, am grateful at, uh, for your uh, attention and, uh, hope for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Sandell. And hearing no further discussion, I'll renew my motion that House File 4020 be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill is laid over. Finally, on the agenda, we have House File 3550 from Representative Baker. We have 30 minutes scheduled for this bill, and uh, we have a little extra time, but uh, we might end up with a little extra time in our calendars today. And um, we will plan, uh, I will move that House File 3550 be referred to the Workforce and Business Development Committee. We have before us House File 3550. Representative Baker, welcome to the committee. Please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And, and this is a uh, uh, really a work from our folks in the industry. As many of you know, I, I am in the, in the industry myself. My wife and I own a hospitality company in uh, Western Minnesota in the Wilmer Spicer Lakes area. And um, we all know how COVID affected us in this industry. We still hear it referred to every single day when we think about the damage it caused to certain industries. And Hospitality is at the top of the list. Um, what we have in front of us, uh, members, is really it's a it's a bipartisan uh, bill that I'm really proud to have uh, members from both sides to sign on this. It's extremely simple and it's low. Uh, it's not a very expensive bill either. But uh, working with our uh, great partners at the University of Minnesota and the Tourism Center at the U, which is again there's not there's I think there's only a few in the whole country that have a center like this at the university system. Along with our Explore Minnesota Tourism Partners, we think that uh, a, a program, an online program for hospitality workers, which uh, could be put together very similar to what we've seen in, in, in our next door uh, state uh, of South Dakota, uh, we think this, this free online program for folks can get people into our industry. And, and many times, our first, our first jobs for our residents in all of Minnesota are in our hospitality world. It's, it's baby servers. It's it's bus boys or girls, it's cooks, it's, it's uh, people that are checking in, people cleaning rooms, and this system allows them to start getting a feel for what the overall uh, idea might look like if I ever want to excel in this, in this profession. So uh, members, I just want to uh, say this is a, a very good program. I've got a couple of testifiers here today, Madam Chair, and I'll let it turn over to them. And again, 
I'm happy to wrap it up and answer any questions that we have. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, now with us today is Ben Hoagslin. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members and staff. My name is Ben Wogsland and I'm the Executive Vice President for Hospitality Minnesota. We represent Minnesota's uh, restaurant and food service, hotel and lodging and resort and campground industries here in Minnesota. I uh, want to thank you for hearing the bill here today to our bipartisan authors. Uh, members, you should also have in your packets a, a, a list of our coalition supporters on this bill, uh, including uh, the chamber and many uh, local uh, chambers and visitors and conventions bureaus and other hospitality partners. And we, we thank all of them for their partnership on this as well. Also want to thank the U of M Tourism Center for being a wonderful partner in trying to get this program off the ground. Um, this industry has been the hardest hit by the workforce shortage. I think there's no doubt about that. We are now currently down still 32,000 workers from pre-pandemic levels. That's about one third of the total jobs deficit from pre-pandemic levels here in the private workforce in Minnesota. Uh, and for an industry that normally em employs one in 10 Minnesotans, that, that's a really big deal. We also know that over the last two years, there have been a lot of uh, workers that have left this industry, either during the shutdowns or the instability related to COVID, and they've made lateral moves to other industries. So as you've talked to uh, uh, operators out there, a lot of the hires they've made over the last six months are young, young people uh, that are either brand new to the industry or brand new to working in general. And so they really need uh, resources resources to train and ladder up uh, and be able to get up uh, more efficient and, and, and move on in their career quickly uh, because there's a ton of opportunity for that. Uh, we, we, this is a huge problem for our industry, this workforce shortage, but it's a huge opportunity for young people that might be passionate about hospitality, connectivity, and serving others. So um, the bill that's before us here is a uh, $275,000 allocation to create a free online hospitality training program modeled after the program in South Dakota. And we began working on this about nine months ago, talking to the folks over at Visit South Dakota about their experience creating something similar. And workers there, employers there in the state just have incredible things to say about how they've been able to train young people uh, and train new workers, as well as training managers uh, in these soft skills that are so needed in our industry. So based on their information and their numbers, we believe that we can uh, train uh, up to 4,000 new employees per year here in Minnesota with a similar program. Uh, we're, we're looking to partner uh, with the U of, U of M's Tourism Center, who you're gonna hear from in just a moment here, that would create the content. It would be statewide, uh, available to everybody here in Minnesota for free, in partnership and in consultation with Explore Minnesota Tour Tourism and industries such as our association and, and other uh, schools and educators out there to, to create content. The way it works in South Dakota is they have 10 different modules that uh, a young person or a, a new worker can go online and they can go through these modules and get educated, get the training they need, and then get certifications for that. We know that young people uh, in this industry want to be able to look at uh, being able to ladder up, being able to get these type of certification programs to show that they are moving forward in their career. And, and it helps them view this industry uh, as a career and not just a job. We know that this is one of the fastest paths to management in America. I think eight out of 10 uh, restaurant managers started at the entry level, uh, nine out of 10, excuse me, nine out of 10 uh, started at the entry level and eight out of 10 owners. Uh, we also know from national data that uh, people that get their start in this industry tend to earn more over the length of their career, even if they make jumps to other industries, because for all the reasons that Representative Baker said at the front. So uh, we think there's a strong need for this. We think it can help solve a problem and help regrow our workforce pipeline here in Minnesota. And in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there, but I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions after the other testifiers. So thank you so much, Madam Chair, members and staff for, for working on this with us. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And with us now, we have Xinyi Chayen. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and the members of the committee for having me today. My name is Xinyi Chen. I am the director of the University of Minnesota Tourism Center. The Tourism Center is a unit uh, within the University of Minnesota Extension, which has a presence in every county of the state. The Tourism Center has been serving our entire state for 35 years, 
We leverage expertise and resources across the university system, across the industry and our state. Um, the Tourism Center is uh, highly interested in being the content creator for this online training program because it aligns very well with our mission of uh, empowering, preparing, and supporting the tourism industry and the communities engaging in tourism for success and sustainability. The Tourism Center has a long history of doing educational and training programs, and we also have extensive experience to deliver programs in an online asynchronous format. We are the only tourism center in Minnesota and also one of a small number of tourism research and education centers in the entire country. In the past several months, we have been working together with Hospitality Minnesota and other partners to explore how to create and deliver an online asynchronous customer service training program, free of charge to business owners and also workers. The Tourism Center stands ready to mobilize a team of colleagues to uh, create a curriculum and then also to create the online delivery mechanism. We also highly value the leadership of uh, Hospitality Minnesota, uh, and we look forward to working together to uh, rally the industry, to work with a wider variety of partners to promote the program, especially to those most in need. We are also excited about opportunities to partner with uh, colleagues from the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities system, um, as we definitely welcome their contributions and value their insights. In the past year, we at the Tourism Center have heard repeatedly from our advisory committee members, partners, businesses, and the communities about the dire workforce situation in our industry. The tourism and hospitality industry was the hardest to hit in our state by the pandemic, and our recovery has also been trailing our neighboring states. As the industry recovers, uh, many new workers, as Ben already pointed out, uh, you know, they are either first-time workers or they are brand new to our industry. And so it is critical to business survival to make sure that these new workers are properly trained on customer service skills. Without these properly trained workers, resorts across greater Minnesota, restaurants on main streets, entrepreneurs in opportunity zones, and the neighborhoods big and small will all be severely stressed by workforce issues. So quite clearly, it is imperative to make sure that our state offers an online program that trains uh, workers in our industry on basic uh, customer service skills to be the ambassadors that they have the potential to be to promote our state as a destination. And then also the program needs to be convenient for workers to go through and has no cost of barrier to either businesses or workers. With that, thank you again for having me today. Thank you very much. Now with us is Jason Subert. Please state your name for the record and pre, uh, start your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee for having me. I'm Jason Subert. I'm the general manager um, of four hotels for TPI Hospitality down here in Fairmont, Minnesota. And I, I do uh, appreciate the comments about Joe Brown, our superintendent, our past superintendent. He just um, retired from our um, district here, but um, been very involved in the um, great work on the vocational um, work that's been done here in Fairmont, Minnesota um, with those other programs. So it's been um, really good to be part of your committee to actually hear so many good things going on to help kids um, um, and their futures here in the state of Minnesota. Um, you know, I've operated 56 hotels in nine states, all while living here in Fairmont, Minnesota. Um, so I've traveled the districts and, and um, seen a, a lot of people in a lot of places approach tourism and hospitality. Um, why are we looking at the program in South Dakota? Well, I, I got the opportunity to see firsthand how their program worked because um, I operated a hotel out in Chamberlain and, and we used the program and it was, you know, tourism is their largest industry in their state. And so they very, very, very um, much focus on um, tourism and being proactive with that program. And, and I think that's the biggest thing that is different about South Dakota because 
you know, we have hotels in the Hilton brands and Marriott's and all of these IHG, these large, huge international companies in hospitality, and they have great training programs. But the one thing that they don't do is they don't teach you about hospitality in Minnesota. Um, South Dakota's program is very designated towards teaching people how to be a great ambassador about their state, not only the city that you live in, but your state that you work in. And that's different in Minnesota than it is in Texas or California and other places. Where are your guests coming from? Also being proactive, just like we have you know, a women's final four coming up and, and things that are going on in our state and going and going to be happening, but we're going to have guests that are coming for that. And so that's part of their program. And, and it really is a helpful helpful program to operators. Um, just to speak for a second here, as a, as a kid myself who grew up in this industry, you know, one in three Minnesotans, their first ever job is in hospitality. One of the things that I want to highlight is that we teach kids how to work. You know, we are in the manufacturing industry. Um, matter of fact, Pete Mahalaf, who owns Pittsburgh Blue Restaurant, um, had told me one time, he said, you know, we do something that very few um, I don't think another industry can do is we take a custom order, um, we produce it, we provide it, it's consumed, and we get feedback all within 45 minutes. Nike can't do that with tennis shoes. Not too many manufacturing organizations can do something like that. But when kids learn these skills, they learn how to prepare for being busy. Well, if they go on to be an engineer at 3M, they're going to have to learn how to prepare and have inventory and all of these things. And our industry teaches people to do that. And I love to hear that Katrina um, worked for eight years in the, in the casino and was working in our industry. You know, our industry helped her someday become a successful lawyer. And, and the work that she learned how to do was you know, that work ethic was learned in our industry um, by the people that work in our industry. And um, and those are great things. You know, the Explore Minnesota just posted their 2021 um, overview, their annual report. And in it, their Explore Minnesota kind of highlighted that we have 16% of our workforce, as Ben said, that's 32,000 people that's been missing. And one of the things that I try to share with people is during COVID when we were shut down and travel wasn't happening, Folks, what was happening is we were struggling to provide hours for our people that have been with us for 20 years and these long-term employees that are career professional hospitality employees. But we weren't hiring these 15, 16-year-old kids. And so we have two years of time where you talk 32,000 people were missing from our industry. I would say 80% of those were kids that are in that 15, 16, 17-year-old mark. Those kids weren't learning how to work and learning that manufacturing process. And we're gonna feel that for a long, long time because they haven't worked in our industry. Well, I don't know if they were working anywhere. And so this program really helps us speed the, speed, um, the, the curve up to be able to help ramp um, training and, and learning how to work. Um, because that's it's a, gonna be a critical element to other industries as we keep going forward. Um, you know, I work with um, the Hospitality Minnesota Education Foundation and hospitality and tourism management programs um, are available throughout high schools in the state of Minnesota. There's 21 schools right now that offer that program. Um, kind of falls in your, your trades um, industry as well through the vocational program. Um, and this program would work directly with those hospitality tourism management um, program schools. Um, so those, ki those kids could learn more about Minnesota tourism through, the, through their high school programs. And um, I helped the New Richland High School with their program. And, and, um, and the, the kids are really eager to learn, um, but not a lot of them are working. And so we got to help them get to work. And our industry is seeing a huge forecast and is, is rebounding. Travel is happening. And I think you've all seen that, you know, air traffic for spring break was up 400% over last year. People are going to be moving. There's a great opportunity for the summer for a lot of people to be working. And, um, and we're looking forward to that. So thank you for having us. And I certainly field any questions if you had. So thank you. Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I have to say this bill is really intriguing to me. Um, I looked at um, South Dakota's program and 
I see that many of the things that are on here could be used not just for hospitality, but for other industries as well. Um, but I'm curious, is it uh, going to be produced as a multilingual type program? Uh, uh, let's see, um, Mr. Hogsland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Representative uh, Cleborn. So we have had conversations already with the U of M uh, Tourism Center about uh, translation and what languages we could offer this in. Our goal would be to make this as accessible as possible to, to young people out there, uh, which is part of the reason we want it to be free uh, of charge as well. Uh, since you had a chance to look at that list, you'll see that, you, and you mentioned, and I think this is important, uh, Mr. Subert touched on this a little bit, but so many of the soft skills that you learn in this industry and in hospitality industry are, are translatable. Uh, I think that's why you see folks that started this industry earning more over the course of their career because they learn, you know, dependability and how to communicate clearly, how to triage uh, situations with customers, how to deal with stressful situations or, you know, people that are having a problem, how to be a problem solver. And this marries all that with the, con you know, concepts within hospitality of being of service and of, you know, knowing your state, knowing your region, knowing your town, your city, uh, and, and being able to help connect people. Um, so that, that, those skills, as you point out, are very uh, translatable to, to other, uh, 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 other industries as well. I don't know if uh, Director Shin Yi Chen wanted to comment any more on the translation piece or the, the language offerings, but that is definitely something that we've had conversations about. Uh, Representative uh, yes, Pardee, thank you. Follow. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, th thank sorry. you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Cleveland. Um, yes, we've had a conversations about uh, multilingual offering, um, but uh, I think more conversations are definitely needed in terms of to what extent uh, the program can be uh, created and maintained in a in a multilingual uh, capacity. Because if uh, you know having um, what do you call it, closed captioning in a different language is a completely different mechanism compared with. We have someone who speaks, for example, uh, Spanish coming in and are recording all the video. As you can imagine, the amount of work and the amount of resources needed for uh, these two closed captioning versus having a Spanish speaker vastly different. And so um, <clears throat> I would be happy to continue uh, the conversation and uh, definitely keep on a radar for uh, in terms of the multilingual needs. Madam Chair. Yeah, Representative Cleveland. Thank you. And I'll just keep this real, really short. Um, as this program, if it goes forward, I would really encourage you, you know, you keep talking about kids, but in fact, there are many adults who spend their entire lives in hospitality, as you stated earlier, and they come to hospitality at different times in their life. And oftentimes they're the first jobs that uh, new immigrants have in our uh, economy. And I just wanna make sure that we are not setting up a system that excludes people from the very beginning. So if we're going to take the time to make the investments to set up a program like this to serve hospitality, let's make sure that we keep it open for everyone and make it accessible for everyone. Thank you very much. Representative, uh, um, okay, uh, Mr. Wags, uh, excuse me, Wagsland. Yes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Cleveland. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I know we've talked a bit about youth and new workers because those have been a lot of the hires, but this is meant for, for everyone, absolutely. And that's been the experience in South Dakota, whether it's people that have already been in the industry and need a refresher as managers or people that are joining the industry later on in life for a variety of reasons. Uh, the universality of it is one of the things that they spoke to as being what made the program great there because it's accessible to anyone uh, at, at any time for free. So uh, totally agree. And that's what will remain at the forefront. Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple questions maybe for the author or other individuals here. Um, first, I want to make sure that we're really careful about how much we're referencing South Dakota and their hospitality industry right now. And the fact that Rapid City is dealing with a hospitality industry that is actually trying to make a ban against indigenous people staying at their hotels. And so I sure hope that that's not what we're saying here, that we wanna replicate South Dakota and the hospitality industry in that capacity. Um, 
so can I, that's a question I want to I want to ask, like in this training, how are we addressing inclusivity uh, in this training? And then I do have a follow up question. OK, Representative Baker. Hey, Madam Chair, yeah, Ma ahead. Madam Chair, let me just take a swing at this first, because, again, I think what we're trying to replicate uh, uh, Representative Keeler for this is just an online system that is certainly going to be better than South Dakota. I'll say that right in front of everybody because we have so much more to offer. But it's also it gave us a model to start building our own components about what is great about Minnesota. Uh, and Explore Minnesota Tourism has really done a great job in their marketing over the last decades about this. But uh, understand Minnesota is way more open to uh, showing the best of Minnesota. And the best of Minnesota is our cultures and our, it's our arts. It's our, it's our water. It's so many more things, too. So I, I will assure you that uh, the partners that I have been working with on this thing are going to be very open to all. And we want to make sure that we promote this because, again, for me, um, you know, we've got many people in our industry, including myself. I've got uh, housekeepers and front desk people that are, uh, you know, folks in that, in that you know, indigenous side and, and East Africans. And so we are going to continue to be very open about that. But great question. We'll make sure that our partners are, are doing a much, much better job than any other state in the country. Representative Keeler. I really appreciate that and would be happy to be on board in any of those conversations. I worked in the hospitality industry and I know that that was one of the areas that we had concern on. Uh, my second question is, um, you know, what does this training look like when it comes to having conversations around human trafficking? Um, because we know our, our hospitality industry um, sees a lot of human trafficking without knowing what they're seeing. Um, and so I guess I would just want to know what is the conversations behind the scenes about making sure that we're addressing that conversation when it comes to this training. Um, because I think no matter, you know, if you're at the front desk, if you're working in housekeeping, um, if you're working in the food industry, these are really important conversations that I think we need to make, make sure that we're having. And Madam Chair, Baker. Madam Chair, and again, one of my colleagues uh, on the on the testifying list may want to comment this, but to this, but Representative Keeler, you're on a very important item that has not been ignored for the last several years. And in fact, I will tell you that most communities through their CBBs, uh, through their hotel associations, have actually done many 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 things uh, in the past years to understand how to look for the signals how to look for maintenance to be uh, looking to see if there's anything of evidence that is looking unusual. If we see a do not disturb sign on a, sign on a, on a room for multiple days and people are kind of coming in at all hours, uh, we are gonna get into that room. We have actually in the Wilmer Lakes area uh, have had every single hotel manager and the employees come through over the last several years. Uh, again, at no charge to the CBB, but we are making sure that we're looking for the signals. Uh, so that is going on. I don't know that that's gonna be part of this program, I'm sure there'll be maybe some safety components, but between human trafficking and all those kind of things and people paying in cash and drug dealing deals, we want to make sure that our hotels and our operations are safe. Uh, but that's happening right now as well. Madam Chair. OK, excuse me. I need to uh, pause our committee hearing for a moment. I need to pass the, ch the gavel over to Vice Chair Christensen. I have a bill up in another committee. so. Chair you, Christensen, Chair. Uh, represent, rep, rep, okay. Yeah. Representative Baker, were you talking to me? Okay, I Vice. Just, yeah, go ahead, sorry. That's it. Thank, no, you. Go ahead. thank you, Chair Bernardi. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Christensen. So, uh, Mr. Walsland, you had a comment? Yeah. Um, Ma I, I, Madam Vice Chair, could I inter interject before we run out of time one quick second? A housekeeping thing? Uh, Representative Kosnick. Um, I missed the roll call, so if I could just have the uh, staff note that I am present before we run out of time. Thank you. Thanks. Acre rubble pit in the city of Savage. I might want everyone to mute. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Waldsland. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Representative Keeler, you raise an excellent point. Um, I think that that could certainly be contemplated as part of this. Uh, Minnesota uh, in, in Hospitality Minnesota actually worked with the health department in the last few years on the mandated training that's required 
uh, under current law for ho hotel managers, uh, on-site employees. There, there's some video training and other uh, resources that are out there now under current law. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you uh, offline as well about how that might dovetail with the training that we're talking about here. But, uh, you know, I think we've tried to be leaders on this issue here in Minnesota, and obviously there's still work to be done. But um, appreciate you and be happy to talk further about that. Representative Kaler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would like follow-up conversation on that because I just truly believe that we can never have too many conversations about human trafficking, sex trafficking, murdered and missing Indigenous women, um, even if it's a small component of this. Um, I just, I really don't want us to miss that opportunity to continue to talk about it in as many spaces um, as we need. So yes, please follow up with some conversation um, on how we can do this. I'd love to be involved in that. And, and thank you for bringing this um, to the forefront and allowing me the opportunity to talk about some of those concerns. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Um, I don't see any other comments. Representative Baker, would you like to close? I will, Madam Chair. And thank you members for very good questions. Again, um, our hospitality industry um, is looking for a one-time front money of 250,000 plus $25,000 a year to kind of make sure that we can maintain this online program to make sure that we're current with regulations and updates and what the Minnesota has best to offer for our for our newest and our um, and, and ongoing employees here in the industry. So uh, I just really am proud about this bill. I'm proud of the partnerships that have been developed uh, out of the understanding of, of what this pandemic did to our industry. We can't we can't generate people fast enough for us, but we can start a pipeline that we will own it. We'll see it funded for a le very low amount of money. Uh, I just think this is a really good program and we just really uh, appreciate everybody's support today. Thank you, Representative Baker. So I see no further discussion. I will re renew my motion um, that House File 3550 be referred to the Workforce and Business Development Committee and the CLA will take the roll. Uh, Chair Bernardi, it's excused. Vice Chair Christensen. Yes. Vice Chair Christensen, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, aye. O'Neill, aye. Representative Albright. Representative Albright. Representative Daniels. Daniels votes aye. Daniels, aye. Representative Erickson. Erickson, aye. Erickson, aye. Representative Hansen. Representative Hansen. Representative Heinzeman. Representative Heinzeman. Representative Howard. Howard, aye. Howard, aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn, aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Creshaw. Creshaw, aye. Creshaw, aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. Representative Meckland. Aye. Meckland, aye. Representative Noor. Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Sandell. Sandell, aye. Sandell, aye. Representative Sandstead. Aye. Sandstead, aye. Representative Thompson. Thompson, aye. Thompson, aye. Representative Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Hansen. Representative Heinzman. Aye. Heinzman, aye. Madam Chair, there are 17 ayes and zero nays. Okay, there being um, 17 ayes and zero nays, the motion passes and House File 3550 is referred to the Workforce and Business Development Committee. Thank you to all the testifiers and thank you members. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, March 29th. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.